There are moments in video games that will stick with you forever and for me, stepping out of the Temple of Time as an adult in Ocarina of Time is definitely one of them. Never before had I played a game where the world you knew changed so drastically over the course of the story. What was once a bustling town square is reduced to a silent, dead infested ruin. The iconic Hyrule Castle is now a gothic stronghold straight out of a Dracula film. There's no music either, only the sound of crows and an eerie wind blowing across the empty streets. What used to be one of the most lively places in Hyrule had transformed into an absolute nightmare. It was quite the shocker for my 11 year old self, I can tell you that much. Castletown was one of my favorite areas to go and hang out. I knew every NPC and what they had to say, I did all the side quests and mini games. it was just a great place to catch your breath from the dangers of the outside world. But suddenly that was all over. Of course, Hyrule Castle and town are not the only places that have been affected by Ganondorf's power grab, but for me it did hit the hardest, especially when you realize that not everyone seems to have made it out alive. And I'm not just talking about the king and his soldiers, but possibly civilians as well. In fact, Ocarina of Time, despite its relatively low NPC count compared to later titles, probably has the highest number of unsolved missing persons cases in the entire series. People and beings who were there one moment, only to have disappeared seven years later, never to be seen again. It may seem like small potatoes compared to, say, the Great Calamity, which wiped out like 90% of Hyrule's population. But the main difference here is that we don't actually experience the events of the Calamity through gameplay, so the emotional attachment isn't as pronounced. Like, imagine for a moment that the first 10 to 15 hours of Breath of the Wild took place before the apocalypse, giving you the opportunity to explore Castletown, talk to people, maybe do some side quests for them, basically getting to know the kingdom and its people during its heyday, only for Ganon to wake up and destroy everything you've come to know and love. That's basically what Ocarina of Time did, albeit on a much smaller scale. So today, let's take a closer look at Ganondorf's takeover of Hyrule's capital, in particular the people who went missing as a result of this and what could have happened to them during Link's absence. In this video I will mainly focus on Castletown and the neighboring Kakariko village. Not only do these locations hold the vast majority of the missing persons cases, they are also intrinsically connected to each other, with one serving as a place of refuge for the other. While it does seem that some members of the other factions have disappeared as well, most notably the Zora, due to their appearance in this game it's kinda difficult to determine who is who and whether or not everyone is accounted for by the end. The only notable exception is the disappearance of Lord Jabu Jabu, but that's a topic for another video. Anyway, let's rewind the clock seven years and start at the beginning. To get an idea of what could have happened to Hyrule's missing residents, I think it's only fitting that we start by outlining the events that led to their disappearance, which in true Zelda fashion requires filling in some gaps. While the outcome of the battle for Hyrule's capital is evident, we don't actually witness much of the event ourselves. After all, we experience the story from Link's perspective and he basically goes into stasis for seven years. As such, there's a lot of information that you, the player, are denied. The panic, the disorder, the clash between the armed forces and Ganondorf's followers, the stream of refugees who had to abandon their homes and flee for Kakariko, all of it is left to the imagination. We don't even know how long the battle lasted for, whether it was a swift victory for Ganondorf or if the soldiers actually managed to put up a decent fight. That being said, we do get some information here and there, which allows us to piece together a rough idea of what happened. For starters, Ganondorf's power grab didn't actually start out as a full-on invasion, but rather a calculated assassination plot to overthrow Hyrule's leadership. Instead of just kicking in the front door and going in guns blazing, he specifically targets the royal family, starting with the murder of Zelda's father, the King of Hyrule. This would have been pretty easy to accomplish for him too, because in an earlier part of the story we can see Ganondorf meeting with the king so it's likely that he was a common and trusted visitor at the castle. All he had to do was request another audience with the king under a false pretense and then strike as soon as he set foot inside the castle walls. After disposing of Hyrule's monarch, he swiftly turns his attention to the heir to the throne, Princess Zelda, who under the protection of Impa manages to escape the castle just in time. It's at this moment that Link arrives at the town gate to meet with Zelda as they originally planned, but as we all know, it was already too late. He catches a glimpse of the princess fleeing town on horseback with Ganondorf hot on their heels. Powerless to stop the Gerudo King from giving further chase, he takes the ocarina, opens the door of time, pulls the legendary master sword, after which his spirit gets sealed inside the sacred realm for seven years. Next thing we know, Castletown is in ruins and Ganondorf rules the kingdom. 
So yeah, a lot of stuff went down during Link's absence, most of which remains open to interpretation to this day. So let's start with what we do know. First and foremost, it's clear that Hyrule Castle and town didn't fall immediately after Link pulled the Master Sword. We know this because when we travel back seven years, we arrive at a point in time after Zelda has already fled the capital, but still before it came under siege, and there's still ample amount of time for Link to complete various goals here, like entering the bottom of the well and clearing the Spirit Temple. So we have to assume that the attack didn't start until quite some time later. In fact, when Link pulls the Master Sword for the first time, it's revealed that Ganondorf actually followed him into the Sacred Realm where he would eventually obtain the Triforce of Power. As such, we can assume that when Link travels back to the past, he arrives at a time when Ganondorf is either still inside the Sacred Realm searching for the Triforce, or he's already back in Hyrule and is out there somewhere gathering his forces for the invasion. Though, personally, I lean more towards the first option. During this time, this calm before the storm so to speak, it's apparent that Hyrule's residents have yet to realize the gravity of the situation. Instead of panic and disorder, the people, including the armed forces, seem confused more than anything. In fact, we only meet one individual who seems to know what's going on, which also happens to be the first confirmed casualty of Ganondorf's coup. If you go to the back alley of Castletown right after the cutscene of Zelda's escape, you can find a mortally wounded soldier who explains that Ganondorf betrayed the King of Hyrule. It's not confirmed if the King is already dead at this point or if he's still being held prisoner at the castle, but either way, the end result is the same. He goes on to explain that when Zelda escaped from the castle, he tried to stop Ganondorf's men from giving chase, which evidently didn't exactly end well for him. After the exchange, the soldier collapses from his injuries and stops moving, marking the first and only death in Castletown that we actually witness for ourselves. From here there's not much left for the player to do except go to the Temple of Time. With the princess gone and Hyrule Castle under lockdown, it's only a matter of time until Ganondorf returns and brings down the hammer. And bring down the hammer he most certainly did. As mentioned before, we don't really know how long the battle for Hyrule Castle lasted, though I will say, given how powerful Ganondorf already was without the Triforce, I'd imagine the fight probably didn't last very long. One thing I've noticed is that there's some conflicting information in regards to the involvement of the Gerudo during the invasion. On the one hand, there's a guy on a roof who, after Zelda's escape, says that it's rare to see Gerudo around these parts, thus something fishy must be going on. Now, it's possible that he's referring to Ganondorf himself, though considering that we just saw him visiting the castle not too long ago, his presence in town shouldn't raise this kind of suspicion, so it's definitely implied that he had some of his people with him. Contrary to this, the wounded soldier refers to Ganondorf's men, which is a bit of an odd thing to say considering the Gerudo are famously an all-female nation, and this is common knowledge among the Hylians. There's also the conversation with Naburu, who asks if Link is a follower of Ganondorf. Why would she ask something like this to a Hylian boy, unless Ganondorf also had male followers? Of course, she could just be pulling your leg, and the quote from the soldier could simply be an oversight or a mistranslation. But if it's not, then it's possible that the Gerudo didn't take part in the actual invasion, or at the very least were not the main force behind it. I mean, the only Gerudo we meet who are unmistakably just as evil as Ganondorf himself are his surrogate mothers, Kaome and Kotake, so perhaps they had a hand in some of it. Who knows? Judging from some of the environmental storytelling, it seems Ganondorf's invasion force mainly consisted of monsters, like the horned skulls we find right alongside helmets of fallen soldiers, which I guess could be a breed of moblin or some other creature. And there's also the Redads who still linger on the town square. To me it suggests that Ganondorf may have amassed a separate army somewhere, perhaps from inside the Sacred Realm which became corrupted after he stole the Triforce. Either way, I'd like to think that at best some of the Gerudo may have assisted in the assassination of the King, but I doubt they took part in the destruction and slaughter at Castletown. After all, by the time we meet the Gerudo, most of them, including Ganondorf's own second-in-command, have disavowed their leader for his cruelty. It also makes the celebration at the end a little more sensible, doesn't it? I mean, think about it, would you be dancing and celebrating right alongside the very people who just a few years ago murdered your friends, family and neighbors? I don't know, I don't think I'd feel very comfortable with that. Anyway, it's safe to say that Hyrule never stood a chance, and by the time Link returns seven years later, Hyrule's army is practically non-existent. Not a single soldier is left standing. Well, I'll accept one, but we'll get into them in a bit. 
Even after Ganondorf's defeat, when the people celebrate Hyrule's liberation at the ranch, there are no soldiers present among the crowd. Which does make sense, of course. Besides the royal family, Hyrule's soldiers would be the first to go. Not only would they pose the biggest threat to Ganondorf, their obligation to protect the capital and its people would have prevented them from running for the hills like the civilians did. That said, it seems that not even some of the civilians may have been able to escape the onslaught. Which finally brings us to our missing persons cases. To get a clear picture, I've outlined every NPC from Castletown and Kakariko who we know for a fact were present at these settlements before the invasion. The only exception I made is the Goron who hangs out at the bazaar. Again, because most of the other races look exactly the same in this game and many of them don't even have names, it's hard to determine which Goron this actually is and if they're still around 7 years later. They could very well have died during the attack, but they also may have escaped and returned to Goron City, and are now one of the prisoners inside the Fire Temple. There's just no way to know for sure. I also left out Talon, who does live at Kakariko in the future, but not because of the invasion. Instead he was kicked out of the ranch by Ingo, which allegedly happened sometime after Ganondorf became king. To keep the list more concise, I also grouped some characters together. These include the five carpenters, the folks who are lumped together buying goods from the market, and the majority of Hyrule's soldiers and guards, who, similar to the Gorons and Zora, are indistinguishable from one another. The only ones I do treat separately are the two that are stationed at Kakariko Village, and the one inside the guardhouse close to the entrance to Castletown, which, again, we'll get into later. Lastly, I did not take into account any theoretical characters, like the ones who may have lived at the castle, for example, like servants, cooks, jesters, and so on. While they probably did exist, we never see them, so there's no point in listing them. The only one who did make the list is the king himself, who we never see either, but he's at least mentioned several times. So first up, we have all the survivors who were evacuated to Kakariko Village, which is 12 people in total. Not only do we know their whereabouts, but we can still meet with them in the future. Then we have 6 characters who also made it out alive, but for whatever reason are not seen in Hyrule after Ganondorf took over, at least not during gameplay. Their whereabouts after the time skip is a complete mystery, but we do know they are still alive, because all of them show up at the celebration at the end. So wherever they were hiding, they did decide to return to Hyrule after the dust settled. Then we have three cases of a confirmed death. The King of Hyrule, most of his soldiers, and the saddest one of all, Richard the Dog. Now in the case of Richard, it's not clear if he died during the invasion or after. Personally, I think he made it out alive. His owner is one of the survivors who now lives at Kakariko Village, and given how obsessed she was with her pupper, I highly doubt she would leave him to die in the chaos. The more likely scenario is that Richard simply died of old age. I mean, seven years have passed after all, and dogs only have a lifespan of about 10 to 15 years. As for all the other dogs that used to roam the streets of Castletown after dark, we can only guess. But in my headcanon, they all survived and started their own dog village out there somewhere. Next up we have three special cases. Obviously Zelda and Impa speak for themselves. They escaped successfully, went into hiding in an undisclosed location, and then came back to Hyrule shortly after Link's return to help him in the fight against Ganondorf. We have no idea where they lived during those seven years, but I think the most sensible option is that they crossed the kingdom's border. The soldier inside the guardhouse is a different story. Not only is he the only soldier who seems to have survived the carnage at Castletown, he still lives there now. I'm of course talking about the Poe Collector. According to his own testimony, it's implied that he swore loyalty to Ganondorf, which is probably why his life was spared, and as a result, he is now the only living resident left in town. We'll touch upon him a bit more in a later segment when we talk about a different character. Character. But for now I will say that even though it's never outright confirmed anywhere, not even in the books, I think it's safe to say that the soldier and the Poe Collector are indeed the same person. Unsurprisingly, he does not show up during Hyrule's liberation party, so either he's still held up at the Castletown ruins, or since he is technically a traitor, he may have decided to leave the kingdom to escape persecution. Anyway, with these characters taken off the list, we are left with a whopping 11 Castletown residents whose fate and whereabouts are completely unknown. They do not show up anywhere in future Hyrule and are not present at the celebration. Next, let's take a look at Kakariko. Because despite the fact that the village was not attacked back then, strangely enough, some of its residents did disappear also, though not nearly as many as in Castletown. Right away we can remove all the characters who we know are still alive, including the refugees. They either still live in Kakariko, or like in the case with the carpenters and their boss, they move to a different part of Hyrule, specifically Gerudo Valley to repair the bridge there. The resident gravekeeper Dampe is confirmed to have passed away during the 7 year time skip, though his spirit can still be interacted 
interacted with. Then we have the son of the carpenter's boss. He still lives in Kakariko, but at some point in the story he goes missing in the Lost Woods, never to be seen again. If you want to know more about his story, I made two videos related to this topic. One about the so-called curse of the Lost Woods, and one that focuses on his disappearance. I do advise that you watch both parts in order, since they are complementary. With these characters removed, we are left with four characters from Kakariko whose whereabouts in the future remain a complete mystery, which when combined with the missing residents of Castletown adds up to a grand total of 15 missing characters. So what happened to these people? Well, needless to say, we don't know, and likely never will. All we have are theories, but there's not a whole lot of evidence to work with. Still, I at least want to give you my two cents. So what I'll do is I will take each character or set of characters and put them in one of two categories based on whether I think they are still alive or if they are dead by this point. The first thing to point out is that out of the 15 missing characters, there are three, all of which are Castletown residents, who are considerably older than the others. And as such, their chances of survival are obviously lower. Not only would they be less likely to make it out of town alive during the attack, but even if they did, there's always the possibility that just like Dompe, they've since passed away from old age. Granted, there is an example of a refugee who is still alive and well, despite their old age. But they could be the exception. I mean, some people just live longer than others, you know? So while we can't say anything for sure, I'm gonna put these three in the dead category. Next, we have one of the most famous missing persons cases in Ocarina of Time, and one who also ties directly into a few other characters. A child from Kakariko, only known as Graveyard Boy. When Link is young, the boy can be found wandering the graveyard doing an impression of Dampe, who he seems to have a bit of a fascination with. After sundown, Dampe offers a sort of haunted house tour, where he will dig up random treasures. But as the kid explains, he's too young to participate, so for him, playing pretend is the next best thing. He even uses a Deku stick to mimic Dampe's shovel, which, I don't know, is kind of adorable. He's also part of a side quest, specifically the mask trading sequence, where the goal is to sell a variety of masks to whoever's interested. In the case of Graveyard Boy, he wants the spooky mask, mainly to hide his innocent face and complete his Dampe cosplay. Eerily enough, this same mask, which looks an awful lot like the face of a redead, is confirmed to be made from a coffin, something even Dampe comments on, wondering why Link is still wearing it knowing what it is. When Link returns to Kakariko as an adult, Graveyard Boy is nowhere to be seen, and even his former house close to the Death Mountain Gateway has been turned into the bazaar. We know he used to live here in the past because when you try to open the door during the day, someone on the other side of the door says that her little boy isn't here right now and that she thinks he went to play in the graveyard. Not surprisingly, the person on the other side of the door, which we can assume to be his mother, is also on the missing persons list. Similar to the king, we never actually see her, so we don't know what she looks like but we know she exists and is also nowhere to be found seven years later. And it doesn't stop there because there's another individual on the list who also seems to be connected to Graveyard Boy as well, namely one of the two guards in Kakariko. If you speak to the one at the entrance to Death Mountain, he says that his little boy has been pestering him to buy him a Keaton mask and will ask Link to get one from him from Castletown. This is in fact what starts the whole trading sequence and the Keaton mask is the first you need to sell to this soldier. Of course, Graveyard Boy ends up favoring the spooky mask instead. But if you talk to him while wearing the Keaton mask, he does say that he asked his dad to get him one too. Furthermore, the guard refers to his son as Little Boy, same as the individual behind the door. He also seems to be stationed at Kakariko permanently and right next to the kid's house, no less. That and the fact that Graveyard Boy is literally the only kid in Kakariko, and I think it's safe to assume that the guard is indeed his father, which would mean that we are dealing with an entire family who's missing, because as you probably guessed, the guard too is nowhere to be found after the time skip. Now, there have been many theories surrounding Graveyard Boy's disappearance. Some suggest that it may have had something to do with the spooky mask. Given the unsettling truth behind the mask, it could be tied to some sort of curse which led to an unfortunate end for the kid. Like maybe he transformed into a redhead because of it. Now, I do love me some spooky stories, but personally I don't think there's enough evidence for this. Sure, the idea that the mask is made from a coffin is kinda creepy, but I mean it doesn't seem to affect Link in any way. Same goes for its original owner, the happy mask salesman. Another theory about Graveyard Boy is that he is actually the Poe Collector. The two main arguments for this is that, first of all, the kid obviously has some kind of fascination with graveyards and the dead and such. Second is the fact that both characters brandish a Deku stick in their right hand. However, that's also where the similarities end, and there's quite a few things working against the idea. 
first is the fact that the Poe Collector calls Link young man, which is a bit strange given that Graveyard Boy is supposed to be younger. Secondly, the Poe Collector is a bit of an anarchist who loves to see the world burn, which doesn't exactly align with the kid's personality. Sure, he may have a bit of a morbid curiosity, but if you try to open one of the graves in his presence, for example, he will tell you not to cause trouble, so his heart seems to be in the right place. Compare this to the evidence that points to the soldier, which is overwhelming. He is stationed in the exact same building the Poe Collector inhabits in the future. There's a Triforce symbol on his clothing and on his wall, suggesting a connection to the royal family. The soldier also expresses the same kind of sentiment as the Poe Collector, stating that things would be a lot more interesting if there were more troubles in the world. And to top it off, when you talk to him at nighttime, he literally admits that studying ghosts is a hobby of his, and that the time may come when that kind of knowledge becomes useful. I mean, come on. On what more evidence do we need? The soldier is the Poe Collector. Which begs the question, if Graveyard Boy is not the Poe Collector, then what happened to him? Well, like I said, Kakariko was spared during Ganondorf's power grab, so I think the most obvious answer is that he and his family simply moved away. Perhaps similar to Zelda to a place outside the borders of Hyrule. And there is actually one more NPC connection that kinda supports this idea. If you talk to the boy's father, you'll learn that he's friends with the guy who owns the bazaar in Castletown. He'll even put in a good word for you, which grants you a discount on the Hylian Shield. And even the Zelda Encyclopedia confirms that the guard and the bazaar owner are indeed acquainted. As such, it's not surprising that out of all the refugees pouring in from Castletown, the bazaar owner is the one who moves in to the family's house. If they were planning to leave Hyrule anyway, it only makes sense that they would sell their house or maybe even rent it out to someone they know. Now, of course, if we step out of the realm of fiction for a moment, I think it's pretty obvious why Graveyard Boy is gone after the time skip. I don't think it's a coincidence that two out of the 15 missing characters on the list are children. If they were still present in Hyrule seven years in the future, the developers would have had to create new, grown-up models for them. Given how ambitious the game already was, they probably didn't have time for that. Or even if they did, it may have been tied to storage space, which was indeed a concern from the beginning of development. Either way, it's clear that child and adult characters models were reserved only for plot crucial NPCs, so removing these two kids from future Hyrule was simply the easiest solution. So yeah, while we don't know what happened to the boy and likely never will, if I had to choose I would say that he's probably still alive, and by extent his mother as well. The only one I'm not too sure of is his father. I guess it kind of depends on whether the Kakariko guards were ordered to stay and protect the village, or if they were called to serve at the castle when it came under siege, and whether they would adhere to that call. The other guard in Kakariko is also gone in the future, so either they fled the country alongside some of the civilians, or they were killed in battle just like all the other soldiers. We don't know. But in the case of the boy's father, I'd like to think that he chose his family over his job. It's what I would do anyway. Screw the monarchy. So that just leaves us with all these other NPCs, all of which are from Castletown. So where did they go? Well, your guess is as good as mine. There's honestly not much to say about these characters, because with the exception of the guy from the treasure chest minigame, they don't serve any practical purpose to the story or your character progression. They exist purely to fill out the space and make the town square look more lively. Not to mention that some of them have like the ugliest and low quality character models in the game, which obviously has to do with the fact that the camera is fixed during the market scene. They were never meant to be viewed up close, so it's no surprise to me that these are some of the people who got left out. As for their fate, I feel that due to a complete lack of evidence and information, it is best left to your own headcanon. It's always possible that they survived and, just like Graveyard Boy and his family, are simply living the good life in some other country somewhere, which we know exists even if we don't actually see it in-game. Others may choose the more depressing option and say they are among the many casualties of Ganondorf's coup. Some might even go a step further and say that the redads we see on the town square is what remains of some of the residents. Though it is worth noting that there's only eight of them, which doesn't account for every missing person. It's also worth pointing out that while it is a bit suspicious that none of them show up at the end alongside some of the other previously missing characters like the Happy Mask Salesman and the Bomb Chew Lady, we can't draw any hard conclusions based on that alone. After all, there are characters who we know are still alive but also don't show up during the credits. Some people just don't enjoy parties, I guess. Or if they're living abroad somewhere, they might not even be aware that Hyrule has been liberated. Personally, as grim as it may be, I would put them in the dead category. Not because I'm a heartless bastard, but because it adds more weight and maturity to the story, as well as to Ganondorf as a villain. We know he doesn't shy away from killing people. That much has been confirmed. In fact, the only reason he didn't kill Link, who, mind you, was just a child, is because he needed him to access the Sacred Realm. If that wasn't the case, chances are the quest would have ended right then and there. 
But what do you think? Did these people survive the onslaught? Or did they suffer the same fate as the king and his soldiers? Be sure to let me know down in the comments. I wanted to take a quick moment to say thank you to each and every one of you who bought some of my homemade merchandise in the past year or so. As some of you may know, my fiance has been hard at work crafting Zelda jewelry and other stuff for the channel and I can tell you she's been ecstatic ever since. It's kind of a dream come true for her and since I never really expressed my thanks directly in a video, I wanted to do that now. So again, thank you all so much for the support and I hope you enjoyed the products. As always, a massive shout out to my Patreons and channel members, including my newest supporters, Crack Snyder, Kitty Lirius, Shayna Dorgello, and Non-Lethal Hitman. You guys are the best. Anyway, that is all for now and I hope to see you all next time.